Lord's house. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're glad you've joined us. Uh, a little nasty out there today, but what good good crowd in the Lord's house. So good to see you all this morning. Um, we are stuck on an opening verse. Our theme, Revive Us Again. And I'm going to read it again. Stand with me if you would like to uh, as we begin our service. Psalms 85, verse 6, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people, hey, God's people, may rejoice in thee? That's our prayer, and that's sure what God wants for us this morning. Lord bless you. Good to see you. Pray with me. Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for another Lord's Day. We can come into your house, and Lord, we can worship. Or how we can come in here and just put everything else aside. I lift up Jesus today, and we thank you for the good crowd that's gathered together. Pray, Lord, you would do a work of grace in this very service. And we're just going to trust you. Our confidence is in you. We're dependent upon you today. Lord, bless us right now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're already standing. Let's, what are you singing, James? Oh, I want to see him. 654, if you like to use the hymnal. Well, we've got several things in the newsletter today. We'll share them uh, with you. Men uh, and ladies' prayer 
5.45 this evening, 6 o'clock, Worship Brother Rich will be preaching tonight. Looking forward to a good uh, Sunday evening service. Wednesday worship, 7 o'clock. I'll be preaching Wednesday night, Lord willing. And then Saturday uh, is our February Men's Fellowship Breakfast. Uh, it's 8 o'clock Saturday morning. Well, the last one, we had a great crowd. Uh, hope you men can join us. 8 o'clock, we'll cook it. Uh, we'll eat it. Uh, we'll have a good time of fellowship. Brother Larry is uh, bringing the devotion, Brother Larry Baker. So we're gonna, looking forward to a good, good time Saturday morning. Uh, by the way, game night went great last night. Thank you, John and Blaze, uh, for that. And uh, had a real good, real good crowd for the first one, uh, and some good food too. So that was that was good. A um, couple updates here, Brother Mike Johnson. He did have his surgery this week, uh, the cancer surgery. Uh, he's still in Missouri Baptist Hospital. May get out tomorrow. Can't wait to get back to church. And he wanted me to thank all of you for your prayers. Uh, he appreciated that so much. Brother Herb is back to Presbyterian Manor. He's in skilled care for right now, uh, trying to get some strength back, and you'll be praying for Brother Herb. Other than that, we got a lot of prayer requests, but I didn't want to bring them to before you and just kind of give you an attention to what's going on uh, there. <clears throat> Hearts for Christ Valentine Banquet, uh, that's just two weeks away. We need you to sign the list so they know how much food to prepare, okay? Uh, inside your newsletter, it's got the menu. Um, not charging for that, T taking a donation. The night, the night of the banquet, we'll just take some donations, and uh, typically by doing that, we're able to pay for all the food, and uh, that, that'll be uh, just a real good evening. So looking forward to that. But do sign the list. Uh, I would say you need to sign that by next Sunday so they just know how much food to prepare. prepare. Uh, February the 18th, Wild Game Dinner. That's here on a Saturday night. Uh, in just a few weeks away, the 18th. Uh, there's some in, inside your newsletter on that also. And uh, so got a lot going on. Month of February is a busy month. You know, our theme is Revive Us Again. Amen? Amen. And February is Revive the Sunday School Month. And we really want you folks to commit and consider and pray about being a part of our Sunday school. As we've, as we've said, you know, what, what, what does it take to make up the Great Commission? Well, evangelism, winning people to Christ. And then edification, teaching and training with the Word of God. And that's really one of the teaching arm of the church is your Sunday school. And so we hope you'll uh, you notice I've been adding one thing every newsletter. Uh, I will invite someone to church this week. I hope you can check that box off this week. Uh, I will hand out a gospel tract. I'll pray for those I've invited. And the fourth thing we've added, and this is all just practical Christianity in, in action. Uh, I will begin a Sunday school class, and I want you to really be praying about that. You know what next Sunday is? It's Someday Sunday. And there's a lot of folks said, you know what, someday I'd love to start coming to Sunday school. Next week is Someday Sunday. All right? And uh, so, uh, you know, we'll have a little fun, but we, we do hope you'll join us for Sunday school. We got a good class and some great teachers for everybody. Hey, I'll make a deal with you. You come. If you don't like it, you don't ever have to come back. How do you beat a deal like that? That's how confident I am that you will enjoy Sunday school. So uh, we hope you'll do that. Listen, God bless you. Isn't it good being in church today? Amen. Praise the Lord. It really, really is. Brother James. I know we have a lot of fun in my Sunday school class, and sometimes we have too much fun, right, Paula? <laughs> Before we sing the next one, we like to recognize those that have had a birthday this week or coming up next week, uh, anniversaries. Do we have any volunteers? Who did? We, we sang for him last week. I wasn't here. <laughs> well, are we singing for you or for Gerald? For me too, Jerry. All right. We'll, we'll have to sing for Gerald one more time. Sorry. Anybody else? No other birthdays? How about anniversaries? What day? Coming up next week. Yeah, how many, Lee? <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Is that all the birthdays? No, no anniversaries. 
All right, let's sing happy birthday for Lee and for Charlene. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Happy birthday to you. Page 363, Jesus saved.
I love the Lord today. I had some work done on my mouth, so if I whistle or spit, you know, there's a reason for that. <laughs> but I was determined to get up here and sing for the Lord. There's a window into heaven I can close my eyes and see where there are no earthly struggles and the soul there is set free where the deaf and dumb are shouting Cause a blind can finally see And those crippled legs are dancing Out across that crystal sea Now there's a special place in heaven Where the unborn babies play And they're rocked in arms by mamas Whose chance has slipped away And all the unwanted children They say, my daddy, he's the king 
and there's smiles on all their faces as they spin around and sing. Now don't that sound like heaven? Don't that sound like home? Where the Son of God is reigning And the tears are finally gone Don't that sound like heaven? Don't that sound like home? Darkness there has been Cause the light is always on The price of heaven is expensive Don't you worry about the cost It was paid in full by Jesus When he hung upon the cross And all the things that he promised Like he said As an eternal reminder Of the precious blood he shed Now don't that sound like heaven Don't that sound like home Where the Son of God is reigning And the tears are finally gone Don't that sound like heaven Don't that sound like home Darkness there's overtaken By the light that's always on Darkness there is overtaken by the light that's always
far too busy to care about your trouble and strife. Oh, he sees the sparrow that falls to the ground, and he hears the tears that don't make a sound. If you only knew how precious you are in his sight. If it matters to you, it matters to the master. He wants to share the burdens you bear. Whisper peace when your world is shattered. If it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain, or if you're only needing an answer, if it matters to you, it matters to the Master. If it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain, if you're only needing an answer, doesn't only matter to you if it matters to you it matters to the master Thank you, ladies. What great specials this morning. Amen. Appreciate that so, so very much. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning. By the way, no test today. Okay? I got you on guard. Uh, no test this morning. But uh, turn to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, chapter 21. Our message today is lifting up Jesus. Lifting up Jesus. Numbers chapter 21. Prayed about it, and this was just the message the Lord wanted to preach this morning. Stand with me, you that would please. Numbers 21, and I'll be reading verses 5 through 9, and we'll have prayer. Here's what happened this is a historical event from the Old Testament, beginning in verse 5. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Well, they was a rebellious bunch, wasn't they? I mean, they complained against God. They complained against Moses. Uh, by the way, that don't pay off. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. Our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the Lord came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a servant of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld a serpent of brass, he lived. As he gazed up to the brazen serpent, he would live. There would be a remedy. If he got bitten by the fiery poisonous serpents and did not look up, he died. Pray with me. Father, we thank you again for the good service you've blessed us with, congregationals, the beautiful specials. Lord, just now anoint the preaching of your word. Lord, we need your touch, your help in this service. Uh, we can't do anything without you. So Lord, help us bring the message you laid on our heart. Let it 
Lord, be a blessing to someone today. Let it be a help to someone today. And Lord, if there's someone here that's without Christ, I pray it be used as a tool to bring that one to Jesus today. Folks, might look up to Jesus for salvation. Now, bless we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. You know, what we've been dealing with as a church this year, and we're just kind of into the year, is practical ways for the gospel light church to fulfill the Great Commission. Practical ways. I mean, things that ought to, you know, some things look good on paper. Hey, real Christianity is living it. It don't just look good on paper. It's to be lived out. But we, so we looked at some practical ways. Invite somebody to church. Hand out a gospel tract. Pray for those you've invited. And as we said, that's, that's the evangelism part of the Great Commission. And then there's the edification part. That's the teach. Excuse me, <clears throat> the teaching of God's word, and, and I believe we do that through through preaching and through the Sunday school effort. But we look at this scripture this morning, uh, and you know what? Last week we saw the assurance of salvation, and uh, I enjoyed preaching that. It was a lesson uh, out of the New Converts course. Uh, you know, as we went through that. It give you a question. It give you Bible answers at the end of it, and you know what was good. God wants all of us to K N O W know we're saved, Amen. not think so, not hope so, not not have any doubts at all. God wants us to be absolutely sure about our salvation this morning. And if you're not sure about heaven today, that's what our altar call is all about. We invite you to come. That's why we pray with folks. That's why we, we, uh, we depend upon the Lord and we pray for victories to be won as people repent of sin and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But as we look to the text this morning, lifting up Jesus, you know, this is a wonderful scripture. And really what it is, it's a picture of the cross. It's a picture of Calvary. It is a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, lifted up on the cross, dying in our place, dying for our sins. Now, we see a lot of pictures of things in, uh, and types in the Old Testament leading up to the New Testament. What does these fiery serpents uh, represent uh, that was biting, that was going around and causing such pain and uh, bitten by these killer serpents? That, that is a picture of Satan and sin, and the sting of death. That, that's a, that is a picture of sin, and, and Satan, and death was the result. If they refused to look up to the pole, the brazen serpent, death was sure, those who was bitten. And you know, we think of Christ, and as, as he hung up there on the, cry, on the cross, we see uh, the brazen serpent, that was a picture of Jesus being lifted up on the pole, that, that all might look unto him and be saved. And all they had to do for a cure, it's kind of simple really, all they had to do for the cure was look up and gaze upon that brazen serpent on the pole. Look to Jesus. That's the type of it. That's the, the symbol of it. That's the picture of Jesus. And it, listen, and by the same token, it would not be a hard thing for any of you today to get saved. It's not like you have to uh, count up all your good works and see that they measure up. It's not about good works at all anyway. All that really matters is for you to gaze up and look to Jesus with an eye of faith and trusting him to be your Savior. Matt's this thing coming and going. I kind of sounds like it might be. We'll try it anyway. And all we have to do is look to Jesus. Now, you know what? What we see then is the simplicity of the gospel. It's simple. I like simple preaching. And I like a simple way to get saved. Let's not complicate something that was meant to be simple. And the simplicity of the gospel, let's begin by saying this. It is the doctrine of substitution. It's the doctrine of substitution. Christ died in my place. Isn't that the truth? 
He died in our place. So salvation is, is not about how good we may or may not have been. Salvation is about sacrifice. About the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying, listen, dying in my place. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, I'll turn over there and um, read this. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, and verse 24. Look what it says. Who his own self bear our sins, get this, in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. That verse is very clear and it says that in his own body, Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, dying for our sins, it was there that that verse says, you know what, he bare our sins in his own body. He died in our place. So there's the doctrine of substitution this morning. Christ dying for our sins. We all needed a Savior. Amen? Has anyone here ever told a lie other than, other than myself? Anyone here ever had an impure thought other than me? Listen, we're all in the same boat, folks. And at some point, we've all failed God. We've all sinned. Therefore, we all need a Savior. We need forgiveness. We need cleansing. And this brass serpent that uh, was put up on the pole back then, listen, it, it was a picture of God's judgment against sin. You know, the, the, there's a diff the different things, they mean something in the Old Testament. Gold spoke of deity. You know what? Silver spoke of redemption. And brass spoke of judgment. And when the serpent was made out of brass and put on the pole, it was a picture of God's judgment against our sins as Christ bore our sins, hanging on the cross, God's judgment against sin. And Jesus took that judgment upon himself. It was the only thing that could satisfy God. We couldn't have done it. We were sinners. It took one who was absolutely perfect and sinless in every way to pay the penalty for sin. And Jesus did that for each one of you and me here this morning. So Jesus Christ was judged on the cross for our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 said, For he was made sin for us. Think about that. He was made sin for us. We think of Jesus hanging on the cross and we, we look up to him and all we can really see is, hey, that's the Son of God. That's the Savior. That's the Redeemer. And yet if you really get a glimpse of what he really is on the cross, he's our sin hanging on that cross. God's judgment against sin. So we find back then in the Old Testament when these fiery serpents would bite someone of Israel. By the way, that was a penalty for God's judgment against their rebellion, their disobedience. And it must have been a very painful thing. And the ultimate result was they would die. And the only way, the only remedy, the only remedy there was if they would look upon the brazen serpent on the pole. You know, we've all been stung by the, the sting of the serpent ourselves, have we not? Oh, listen, and, and, and unless we would look to Christ as our Savior, the truth is there's nothing but death for us either. The wages of sin is death. Not just a, a death of a graveside, but the second death. So here, here's how it worked. What they had to do was lift up their eyes and look up to the brass serpent on the pole. And what brought the cure? What brought the remedy? Here it is. <clears throat> Their faith. If they, if they was really going to step out and believe that if I looked, if I gazed, I would live. That was faith. Faith to believe in the remedy. And today for you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've got to have faith to believe in the remedy. You've got to have faith to believe in Jesus. Hey, to look up to the cross. Hey, as he be lifted up, right, he would draw all men unto himself. A picture of you and me 
looking up to Jesus with eyes of faith, looking, trusting in Christ as our Savior and our Redeemer. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, 1 Peter, chapter 3, and verse 18, 1 Peter 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Hey, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And then I'm not going to go back and read it, but, but if you go back to Isaiah chapter 53, you know what it says? By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Now let me say this. I absolutely believe in physical healing. I believe in God's prescription we find in the book of James where by the anointing of oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I believe that's scriptural. I believe in physical healing and I've seen physical healing. But I want to say this. You need spiritual healing if you ever think you're going to heaven. You need spiritual healing if you're ever going to make heaven this morning. Now one day, good news, all of the saved, the saints, the redeemed, one of these days, we're all going to get a new glorified body. Somebody got to say amen. <laughs> Man, we need that, don't we? We sure do. I mean, no more sickness. Wouldn't it be a good day you're never going to get sick again? No more pain. Never going to hurt again. I mean, I live in a house with a wife that has pain 24-7. 24-7. Never has a good day. Never has a day without pain. And these, these painful attacks in the face, they've been coming every two to five minutes. You can count on it. And it's just beyond imagination. One day, one day, she'll have a glorified body and never hurt again and never have pain again. Listen, it won't hurt anymore again. And I've been feeling a few pains myself these days. I'm, I'm glad when we get the glorified body, no more pain, no more sadness, no more sorrow. So here's what I'm saying. I believe in physical healing. But spiritual healing is a lot more important than physical healing. Hey, what if I was to get healed of cancer and die and go to hell? Didn't do me a whole lot of good in the long run, did it? Spiritual healing is a lot more important than physical healing. So let me say this. Christ is not only my substitute. I want you to get this. This is important. He took our curse upon himself. Hey, the curse. We've all talked about, well, this one get a curse for this and get a curse. Listen, we've all experienced the curse because of sin. And Jesus, not only my substitute, he took our curse upon himself. Hey, why does things go wrong that you didn't see coming? The curse. Simple. Why, why, why does your roof start leaking every now and then or, or, or your plumbing takes out? The curse. How come your car breaks down sometimes? The curse. Why is my sewer running out in the backyard because my septic tank's full and they can't get in because it's too wet? The curse. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, why does, some of you, we got some good gardeners in the church. Did you ever stop and think about this? You get out there and you till up the ground and you plant your tomatoes and your beans and everything else, your cucumbers. You don't plant weeds, but they come up anyway. Where'd them weeds come from? The curse. Are you getting this? So everything in life that don't we not very likable and we we you know, sometimes cause great afflictions to us. It's all part of the curse. We are living under the curse. Now in the book of Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three and verse thirteen. Galatians three and verse thirteen. I want you to get this. Christ, hey the Lord. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Praise the Lord. He's redeemed us from the curse. Being made, notice, not only our substitute, it says he was made a curse for us. So he took my place not only as my sins, but he took my curse upon him too. Notice, 
It says for, I'll read the whole verse again. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Well, where'd this curse all begin? Well, I'll tell you what, Adam and Eve, things was pretty lovely before they sinned. I mean, they had never had a tear. They'd never had to sweat. They'd never, listen, they'd never had a problem. Everything was absolutely heaven on earth. Really. Until they sinned. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they now received the curse. And that's been handed down to generation to generation. Not missed anybody ever since. And what's good to know Christ took our curse upon himself. Now, you say, then why do we still have the, the, the fruits of the curse today? That's one of those things you won't get over until you get that new glorified body. We're still dealing with the flesh here, aren't we? We're still dealing with, with the world here. I mean, some of you are hurting today because of the curse. You know what, this morning, some of your eyes are starting to get dim. Some of your hair is starting to go bad. And some of your teeth are starting to fall out. And you know what? That's the curse. That's the curse. And suddenly here lately, I've been getting a whole lot tireder than I used to. I'm either a sick man or I'm getting old. I don't know which. But man, I'm tired a lot lately. That's the curse. You get this? Praise the Lord. We're going to get a new glorified body. Because Jesus took our curse. Praise God. Not just our substitute, but he took the curse. One day my Bible says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Wow. Haven't seen it. Don't really understand all there is to know about it. But it's going to be, ready for this, better. <laughs> Absolutely going to be better. And, and so we thank the Lord for the, the victory we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. New heaven, new earth. What's going to make it so good? Won't be any more curse there. The curse will be gone. Hey, you know what? Here's something for you to consider this morning. Don't drive your 10 states in, take stakes in too deep today because we ain't going to be here a whole lot longer. Okay? It's time to look up to Jesus. So the pole, what does it speak of today? It speaks of the cross. And it speaks of Jesus being lifted up. Let me show you something. Turn with me. We're real familiar with some of this, but I'm going to show you three verses. John chapter 3. The book of John. Everybody's familiar with John 3, 16. But not so many are familiar with the two verses right before it. John 3, I'm going to read verses 14 through 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Hey, that's what we're looking at today. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, was it really a picture of Jesus? Absolutely. Look here. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him, hey, whoever will look up to him as Savior, should not perish, but have eternal life. And then we see that great verse, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life everlasting life you know remember now when Jesus after he'd risen from the dead he's risen <laughs> hey the tomb is empty wrong address why seek you the living among the dead and now he's risen from the dead and you remember those uh, a couple disciples was on the road to Emmaus remember this and Jesus showed up and when he first showed up it was in a way that they didn't recognize him for who he really was and you know what Jesus started talking to them about? He started talking to them, the Bible says, I'm not going to go back and read it for time, but things concerning himself all the way from Moses and the prophets. Jesus started telling them all things about how he showed up in the Old Testament. Some people say, oh, the Old Testament's kind of hard. It's, it's a little difficult. Man, let's just stay in the New Testament. I'm going to tell you something. The Old Testament's a great place to be. It's, I find Jesus everywhere I look in the Old Testament. Hey, he is everywhere I look in the Old Testament. How about the ark? Noah's ark. Is that not a picture of Jesus? 
Hey, if you're in the ark, that's a remedy. You get saved. Everybody on the outside of the ark, outside of Jesus, outside of salvation, they all perish. The ark is a picture of Jesus. How about Joseph? He's a picture of Jesus. How about Jacob's ladder? Remember that? The angels descending and descending. Hey, there's only one ladder to get you to heaven. His name is Jesus. Jacob's ladder, a picture of Jesus. The tabernacle is a picture of Jesus. The priesthood was a picture of Jesus. And now Numbers 21, the brazen serpent on a pole. Hey, it's a picture of Jesus. Man, that ought to thrill you. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. And you know what? And if you're unsaved today, let me just say this. It's time for you to look up with eyes of faith and be saved. Amen? Hey, look up with eyes of faith and be saved. Well, that was the introduction. Now let's preach. Actually, that was just the first part. Now we're going to go to the second part. The first part is dealing with looking up to Jesus for salvation. But remember what we're talking about this, uh, this month and this year? Practical ways for the church, for Christians, to live for Jesus. So we talk about lifting up Jesus or, or, or looking up to Jesus. Let me give you some practical ways this morning. This is just kind of going to blend right in uh, from a little different aspect. The first part, if you're lost, you need to look up and be saved. If you are a Christian, and that would be absolutely the big majority of you uh, that are here this morning, what practical things can we do to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? What practical things? I mean, like I said, not just look good on paper, but what can we actually do and be involved in that we can look up and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, you ready? I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. Number one, you can lift up the Lord Jesus Christ by you having a right attitude. One amen? Ought to have been a whole bunch of amens on that. Hey, by us having a right attitude, a right spirit, a, a, a godly attitude about ourselves. You know what? If you have a right attitude and a godly attitude, that's the practical way you yourself as a Christian are helping lift up Jesus. By your testimony. Now I'm not talking just about a church. It, it, it has come to my attention all through the years that there's a whole lot of people that have always been able to be good Christians at church, but not always at home. Okay? So when, when we're talking about a good attitude, why well, we're even talking about at home. Husbands and wives. You know what that means? You might, want to, you might want to write this word down because you still got the ink pen from last week, right? You ought to be, you ready? You ought to be pleasant at home. That's not a hard word. Might be hard to, for some of you to do, but hey, we were to be pleasant. <clears throat> that means we don't need to be cranky and, and calloused and cold. That means you don't need to be like a snapping turtle all the time. We're to be kind, loving. You know what that does? That lifts up Jesus. A right attitude lifts up Jesus. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. Granted, you know, life in general can make you kind of sour and kind of mean. Because, man, we live in a tough world, don't we? But God's people ought to have a sweet spirit about them. Oh, lift up Christ with a good attitude. What else can you do to lift up Jesus? as a Christian today. Lift up Jesus with your talk. Amen? Hey, the way you talk, is your talk clean or is it dirty? Is your talk encouraging to those around you or is it discouraging? Does your talk bring a spirit of unity or does it sow discord among others? See, we can lift Jesus up by the way we talk. Amen? Am I truthful? Or do we kind of say those little white lies, which are nothing but big black lies in the eyes of God? Are you a blessing to others? 
by the way you talk. Hey, listen, these are just some practical ways for you to lift up Jesus as a Christian. Have a right attitude. Have, make sure our talk is what it ought to be. Lift up, number three, hey, lift up Jesus with your walk. Not just your talk, but your walk. Listen, we represent God. Amen? We represent God himself today. Our testimony ought to mean something today. Now, I'm going to bring something up. Everybody may not like it, but in, I think I just need to say it. We're living in a day today where with inflation and everything else, there's a whole lot of people really struggling to even survive. The, the, the latest statistic I saw this week blew my mind. 75% of everyone in America is living check to check. Don't matter how much they make, they got used to spending it all. Check to check. 60-some percent of everybody in America, if they had a $400 emergency, don't have the $400 to take care of it. That's kind of unbelievable, really. Now, that's bringing me to say what I'm about to say. You want to lift up Jesus with your walk? Christians ought to pay their bills. And you may be struggling with bills now. I, I think some, probably in a crowd this size, probably several of you may be. Times are tough right now. Hey, when you got to pay $4 for a dozen eggs, right? I went in the other day and got a, a large container of cottage cheese, $9. It's just going crazy. It's going crazy. But you know what? Christians ought to pay their bills if you want to lift up Jesus. It's, it's sad when the world looks at the church uh, and, and has a bad testimony when Christians won't pay their bills. You say, you know, but you don't understand what I got. I'm, I'm kind of up against it. Listen, there's nothing. It's not the end of the world if you get in a financial bind. But don't let the creditors come after you. You contact them. Let them know you're having a struggle. Let them know you're having a rough time. And I'll pay you what I can when I can. Be up front with them. They'll appreciate, rather, appreciate that rather than you trying to sidetrack them. Be honest with your dealings. Try to make things right. Why, what does that mean? You know what? If we're going to lift up Jesus, we've got to be honest in our dealings. That's practical, isn't it? It's good to come in here and say, amen, good preaching. See you next Sunday. But when I say you Christians ought to pay your bills, ooh. <laughs> well, listen, you know what? Paul had the best idea, owe no man anything. Then you're not a slave to the lenders anymore, okay? Nothing wrong with debt free. Say, I can't get there. That ought to be your goal. That ought to be your goal. Hey, if you want to lift up Jesus, do it with your attitude, do it with your walk, do it with your talk. And, and listen, I want you to get a picture of this. It ought to be practical. It ought to be practical Christian living. Well, if the debt thing didn't make you mad, this will sure make some of you ladies mad. <laughs> hey, if you want to lift up Jesus, dress like it. Now I said, I said that to say, you know what, I've never been into the dress code thing and hey, you've got to look like this and you've got to look like that. But I tell you what, if you're going to lift up Jesus, you will dress modestly. I've seen people sing specials in churches and next time you see them, they're out in public, halter top and short charts. That does not lift up Jesus. I don't think we have any of that. I've never seen any of you ladies like that. hope i never seen any of you ladies like that. <laughs> But I tell you what, you want to lift up Jesus? Dress modestly. Amen. That goes for you guys too, right? Oh, listen, this is practical Christian living I'm dealing with here this morning now. It's practical. Hey, you want to lift up Jesus? Do it in your conduct. And by that, you know, how do you react when things go sour? How, how, what's your reaction? How do you respond to persecution? How well do you when everything's going lousy in your life? How, what's your conduct? 
I mean, when I, when I saw the sewer going out in the backyard the other day, I could have had a fit. Threw toilet paper out the back door and everything. I, I could have went crazy. But you know what? I just said, Lord, it's just another day. I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to lift you up anyway. It'll be all right. Hey, no matter what's going on, it'll get better. But how do you respond? You want to lift up Jesus? Have good conduct. One more and I'm done. You want to lift up Jesus? Do it with a commitment to the house of God. Amen? Hey, if everything's going lousy, that is not your invitation to take Sunday off. That's when you clean up, get your Bible under your arm. I'm going to God's house no matter what's going on in my life. Hey, you want to lift up Jesus, do it with a commitment to God's house. Um, that's a good time to put in a Sunday school plug again, isn't it? It is. Hey, get your Bible at 945. I'll meet you at Sunday school. We'll have a good time no matter what's going on out there. Listen, I'm just trying to share some things with you, some practical ways for us to lift up Jesus. We can do it with the right attitude, our talk, our walk, our dress, our conduct, our church. These are all practical ways where the rubber meets the road where we can actually live it and be what we say we ought to be. In closing, if you're here and you've never been saved, go back to the first part I preached. Because it's time for you to look up. It's time for you to, with eyes of faith to look to Jesus on the cross. Because he's the only one that has the remedy and the cure for sin. Oh, listen, let's stand. Have an invitation. Lifting up Jesus. We hope that you are. Father, we come to you this morning in Jesus' name. Pray, Lord, you'd just bless this invitation time. Maybe someone here that needs to get saved. Somebody may need to rededicate their life. Or, or somebody just may have a burden, a need they need to pray about. Just meet the needs of this service. Meet folks right where they're at. And I pray as we leave this place, Lord, it'll be with the right spirit. And Lord, I pray that we'll... we'll in practical ways, try to live out our Christianity in our daily lives in a way that will lift up Jesus. Lord, bless just now, we pray. We thank you already in Jesus' name. Amen. Lamb of God, I come. You need prayer. This next verse, we're going to close. Everybody said amen. Hey, when we, when we leave this morning, let's go out and live it. Amen. amen. Let's lift up Jesus in all these ways. God bless you. Let's sing our song. <coughs> because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he Everybody said, praise, praise the Lord. Praise.